Hello and welcome to today's webinar. My name is David Cash. I'm a member of the marketing team here at Mounts. I'm glad you've taken the time to join us today uh, as we look at our topic of how we can improve quality through the torque verification process. Now, if you have any questions uh, or any comments during the presentation, feel free to put those into the chat and we'll take a look at those here at the end of the presentation. So let's go ahead and jump right in. Um, when we talk about uh, torque verification, um, there is a distinction between uh, torque verification and the torque calibration process. Now, typically the torque calibration is done uh, by methods of testing the torque tool uh, against a standard uh, or a sensor uh, in this case. Uh, and the requirements for that is the sensor must have a greater accuracy of four times um, or at least four times the accuracy of the tool that we are testing um, for that calibration process. And that could be um, either an ISO uh, type of specification or it could be uh, an ANSI Z540 uh, specification. But anyway, that kind of makes the difference between um, the calibration done is uh, a process uh, that is typically done in a laboratory uh, and under, under certain conditions for the calibration portion, a certificate is generated um, and that's just going to be a little bit different than the verification process. Um, however, when uh, a tool does come into uh, one of our three labs that we have, uh, one in San Jose, California at our corporate office, uh, we have one in Foley, Alabama, uh, and also one in London, England. Um, and so when a tool gets shipped to us for calibration, uh, we typically will receive that tool. It is then married to a bin uh, and a bin location uh, that will stay with the tool throughout the journey uh, at the lab. Uh, an order is generated for that tool. Then it goes to the uh, testing uh, phase. And if there are any adjustments that need to be made to that tool, um, it is done during this uh, portion. Uh, of the testing. From there, the tool moves to uh, where we would actually uh, go ahead and generate a, a certificate uh, based off of the readings that uh, were taken during the testing process. Uh, and from there, it then goes to the final uh, inspection. Uh, from the final inspection, it then is uh, sent to uh, shipment uh, or to shipping, uh, and then the tool is ready to be shipped back out uh, to uh, to you when you uh, do that. So uh, this is the process that we have um, here at Mounts uh, for uh, any type of calibrated tool, uh, torque analyzer or torque sensor uh, that would come in. Um, and I'm sure this is uh, the way that it is for most uh, calibration facilities. Um, so Within that, uh, as I mentioned, there is a cert that is generated uh, for that particular tool. Um, and again, it can be an ISO 17025, uh, uh, could be an ANSI Z540 um, certificate. But uh, what uh, kind of I want to highlight um, in that is once you receive that tool back, it's going to have um, some information uh, on it regarding what happened during that, uh, that calibration process. And so uh, if we take a look at a cert that we had uh, done for a tool um, here, um, you can see that the uh, information here regarding uh, what type of tool it is, the range of the tool, uh, what unit of measurement um, is testing in, um, and the accuracy of that tool. Um, and then you'll see the when it was done, uh, what is their calibration interval that's being used, uh, the date that it was done. But the uh, one thing to really take a look at is going to be the arrival condition of that particular tool. And in this case, this tool was found to be out of the manufacturer's specification. And we can see that uh, down here with the readings that were taken during the um, inspection uh, portion uh, and testing of this particular tool that it was below the minimum tolerance for this particular tool. Now, the adjustments were made, and then you can see the tool was then brought into the calibrated state. Uh, uh, the cert was then generated, and it was then sent back to the customer. 
Now, in this case, um, the calibration interval um, is set for uh, six months, um, but intervals uh, can range from anywhere from uh, 12 months, um, it could be 18 months uh, between calibration cycles. Uh, primarily, you're gonna see maybe 12 month cycles. Um, and then there are those rare occasions where uh, we'll have customers that uh, only calibrate their tools based off of performance. So if a tool uh, falls outside of the calibrated uh, range, then that tool then is sent in for either repair or, or calibration. Uh, so that is uh, what we see typically um, when we're doing uh, calibration uh, types of uh, certs. Now just keep in mind uh, that cert and then we'll come back to some of the information on there here in just a second. Um, so what are some of the, uh, the quality challenges when we do have calibration failures? Um, and by calibration failure, uh, I would refer to the cert that the tool came in out of calibration. Um, so this could be an example of a drifting tool. And this can be a, a real challenge because there are some uh, things that um, are really uh, tricky about uh, when a tool drifted. What, at what point did that particular tool go out of calibration? Um, at what point during the last uh, process did it go out? Um, so that is going to have some repercussions on the use of that tool uh, how long uh, was that tool used? Uh, which components uh, or which parts was that tool used on? Are those uh, critical safety components? Now, does, is there any type of rework that needs to be done? Do we need to do any type of uh, additional tracing uh, on how that might affect the, the part down the line, um, depending? So there are these types of uh, ramifications and considerations that must be made and if, if there is any liability that uh, could be generated from uh, that particular part or uh, item not being torqued within the specifications based off of the, uh, the cert that it came in out of calibration um, and it left uh, back in calibration. Uh, but again, what type of information um, or what type of uh, work that needs to be done, the rework, all of that can combine into um, problems that may be associated with the calibration uh, failure. So that's going to bring us to um, our poll question for today. Uh, and uh, that particular question is just a quick yes, no, is uh, do you uh, currently have a torque verification process to validate uh, tool performance um, in your uh, facility right now? So I'll give you just a, a minute here to go ahead and answer that. Um, and then we'll move on with the rest of the presentation. We still have a few people coming in, but it looks like we've got uh, everyone's answer in here. And uh, currently it is uh, the uh, yeses outweigh the noes here uh, by just a few. Uh, so thanks very much for participating in that, uh, in that poll uh, question as we move on through the, uh, the rest of the presentation. And so, um, the torque ver verification uh, quality control process uh, really gives us the ability to have uh, on-demand torque testing um, at any point that, that we would like. So anytime that we want to um, look at a, a specific tool, this can really help to uncover any type of inaccuracy that may be, uh, we might be seeing during the testing of a specific tool. Uh, we can certainly track the uh, progression of a tool uh, during this process. And uh, typically, um, we are doing some uh, frequency of testing uh, in the middle of the uh, calibrated uh, range of that tool or uh, on a frequency uh, within a certain time period. 
um, throughout the uh, the tools uh, calibration process so we can actually chart how a tool does it with its performance and if we are noticing that that tool is starting to drift to the lower end or move uh, to the higher end uh, we can certainly then take a look at what might be happening uh, to cause that uh, is there an issue with the tool is there an issue with the operator is there an issue with the components that we might be using um, so a lot of these types of testing that we can do uh, can help us create uh, excuse me help us to uncover those types of inaccuracies within uh, the manufacturing process and uh, with that it also then gives us the ability to have a really quick uh, action uh, where we can quickly diagnose what might be happening with a particular tool uh, and we can go ahead and correct that uh, before an issue arrives uh, with any type of uh, error with the use of that particular tool. Um, this is going to also help with uh, any type of continuous improvement documentation that might be needed. So if uh, you are an ISO 9001 uh, company and you need to be documenting uh, things that you might be doing to help with your continuous com improvement um, being able to test your tools in between the calibration cycle uh, can help with that uh, that goal um, as well and again this is going to help us be able to save time and money um, with the ability to catch issues with a particular tool uh, before they're sent back out for uh, calibration. And it also could save us uh, money as well, um, as uh, you may uh, look to um, move a tool from a, a time-based calibration frequency to a uh, performance-based frequency. Uh, and we have many customers that actually do that uh, as their process. So they have um, a very good uh, indication of their tools and they keep uh, quite a, uh, a good record of how those tools perform um, and if they see that tool beginning to uh, move outside of its calibrated range then at that point they will go ahead and um, have that tool sent out for calibration or repair and so that tool could perform quite nicely for uh, 24 36 uh, months without having any issues uh, and in that case, that tool then again is only sent out once it is needed to. So depending on um, your process and um, the requirements around uh, the uh, manufacturing at your facility, um, a, a time-based um, process may have to be uh, what is uh, required, um, but often we can move to a performance-based type of calibration cycle as well. Now, um, one thing to uh, consider uh, with that as well is going to be um, the equipment that is going to be needed to be able to uh, do this type of verification. Uh, and so uh, typically you're going to be dealing with uh, either maybe a handheld uh, type of torque analyzers and then uh, a certain range of torque sensors depending on the, the torque range that you would be testing. Um, you could have sensors um, like a rotary type sensor. Uh, this um, is the middle sensor here, uh, and that one uh, goes between your tool and your bit and allows you to be able to test your tool um, actually on your part. You could also use a, a static transducer. This will allow you to be able to test um, either your hand tools um, or you could also test power tools. Uh, with it as well with the use of a joint simulator or rundown adapter um, that would allow the tool to reach its rpm uh, and then uh, go ahead and collect the torque information from that um, so this would be one type of, of scenario where you would use a, a portable tester uh, to either bring those tool or bring this to the tool um, and do your testing um, capture that information um, and then analyze it um, after the fact uh, another type of uh, torque sensor uh, analyzer that you could use would be something like this, where you have the analyzer and the sensor uh, built into it. Um, so again, these types of analyzers do have a certain range for the transducer. 
Uh, it could be some uh, 1 to 10 inch pounds, 5 to 50, uh, 10 to 100, um, or something like that. Uh, but these do have, again, an internal torque sensor uh, that we would be able to use for, uh, again, any type of hand tool, or you could use a power tool with uh, a joint simulator. The other thing you want to look for uh, when you are uh, looking at an analyzer um, is the use of the graphic display. And is there a simple uh, way that you can look at that and have a pass fail type of signal um, or graphic indication that you are within the specification that's needed? Uh, in the case of uh, this analyzer uh, with our uh, EZ Torque 3, um, this does have uh, that. Um, so we can simply enter in um, our torque specification that we need to uh, hit. Uh, and then the graph that is on there will generate the tolerance for us in a green uh, zone, which is going to be right at the top uh, of the display there at the 12 o'clock position. Uh, and then anything to the left of that is going to be in yellow, which would be under. Uh, and anything to the right of that would be uh, red, which is going to be over uh, torque as well. There are a number of different things, and we'll take a look at that um, as we go ahead and jump into um, our demo portion of uh, today. Um, the other thing to consider uh, when we're looking at that is um, what type of plan and schedule would you be uh, looking to implement? Uh, what type of frequency is going to be needed uh, to do that? And the process of gathering the information and collating that in uh, whatever uh, area that you would like um, to be able to refer back to those particular readings for a specific tool, maybe a set of tools, maybe a line, uh, that type of uh, scenario where you're going to uh, keep that data for those particular uh, readings. So uh, overall, the, um, the real benefit of the torque verification process is that it just gives you more control over your torque tools. Um, you don't have to worry about uh, tools that will be coming back that may have been out of calibration, uh, and then that creates um, another cycle of uh, work that may need to be done. Uh, not only researching, uh, then maybe correct of that through re rework or possibly scrap. Uh, so this is really the benefit of the torque verification process is that it gives you uh, much more control over uh, your tools within your facility. So let's go ahead and uh, jump into our demo uh, portion for today. And give me one second while I uh, power up the analyzer. All right. So um, on uh, what we'll be testing with today um, is we have a, a, a torque screwdriver um, that we can use. We'll also have a, a power tool um, here that we'll be able to test with. Uh, and then we also have a, a click wrench that we'll be testing um, as well. Now here is um, our analyzer. And um, so currently uh, right now, what you'll see is here in our operation screen, um, we have what would be our target torque. Uh, we have our tolerance. Um, it then generates our min and max. Um, and then we also have our mode uh, and our frequency that we're using um, as well. And so we can say that anything that's going to be within uh, 28.2 and 31.8 is in this green area um, on here. But uh, if we want to, be able to um, look at a specific tool that we're using. Um, these particular analyzers come with an SD card that is uh, built in here that will time date stamp every reading that is taken. And so if we want to um, do the, the testing of our, uh, of our torque uh, screwdriver, uh, we can certainly do that. Uh, all we need to do is come into our setup menu go to settings number one uh, and here's where we just enter in what our target torque is 
And so I think the screwdriver is set to about 11, uh, and a, let's see, 11.5, I th think there. Um, and we can have our tolerance set. Uh, right now we'll have it set at uh, plus or minus 6%. We can also have our readings that we're taking automatically clear uh, within 0.5 all the way up to five seconds. Uh, this is so you don't necessarily have to uh, tap on the display to go ahead and reset the, uh, the values that we would be dealing with. Um, you can select which unit of measurement you want to deal with. Uh, then we have our mode section. In the case of the uh, torque screwdriver, we're going to want to use that in the peak mode. That's going to measure the highest peak torque generated. Uh, and then we have our filter setting um, at 500 hertz, which is going to be uh, sufficient for, uh, for a hand tool. Now, the other thing that we can do is we can go ahead and we can enter in the serial number for this particular tool. Um, and this is going to allow us to insert that into the data capture that happens automatically. So if we pop in our serial number for this particular tool, now this will show up as a, a row of data within the, uh, again, the data that's captured. And we can tell the system that we want to measure in the clockwise direction only. Um, so we can come back out to um, our operation screen and we would be ready to test. Uh, you can see that it has changed our target um, and then it has automatically given us our min and max. Uh, again, anything outside of these ranges are going to be um, outside of the range that we would be looking at. Now, typically, if we're coming and we're doing testing for a, a tool, if it's being used out on the line and we've brought the analyzer to that, uh, typically, you're not going to have to do any type of uh, <clears throat> exercising of that that tool or uh, basically to, to warm it up. But one thing that I will highlight uh, when we do that here is we have our graph, uh, our graphing mode. Um, and in this case, we can go ahead and we can turn on what our acceptable zone uh, or, again, our what our limits uh, are. And that will put that here in the shaded portion. Um, if I pop our tool onto the analyzer and we go ahead and turn that, you can see that it has generated the curve during the measuring process. And then it also uh, puts it within the, um, the target that we were looking for. And so we can continue to take a look and we can warm this tool. And we can do that. So now if we come back out, uh, to our operation screen, um, you can see that it did um, analyze those five readings. Um, if we do take a look at it, so you can see what it looks like uh, with the graphic interface, it gives us those values there. Again, a really simple way of being able to see if your tool is outside of those readings um, or not. We also have a, an advanced view that we can look at. Um, and in this case, um, it's going to give us um, some of the SPC data that we might be looking for if you want to do any type of, uh, say, a gauge r, &R type study um, where you want to get what your, your CM and CMK um, are, which is slightly different than CP and CPK. That's just, uh, just noting that we're testing a machine or a tool in this case um, and not a process. Um, it's going to give you what uh, your average is, your min, max, and the standard deviation um, here as well. So we can go back to our basic view uh, as well, but it will generate those particular items. So now if we wanted to test um, the click wrench, uh, we could do that as well. Um, let's see, this wrench is set to uh, about 30 um, inch pounds. Now we can go ahead and we could test this here. Um, but what you might see is that as we use it, uh, we're gonna, we might be getting some crazy, or not crazy, but um, maybe some uh, less accurate type of readings uh, just because of the way that the uh, click wrench um, is used. And so in that case, we can come back and we can come into our mode uh, selection. We can change our uh, torque that we're looking for. Um, and I believe this might be closer to 29 
inch pounds, but we can go ahead and set our target uh, for 29 inch pounds. And now in this case, let's change our mode from peak to first peak. And what that does is it's going to measure at the point at with the where the wrench actually clicks. Um, now, because a click wrench um, is very operator dependent, um, if the operator clicks past or pulls past the click point, it's going to introduce a lot of over torque that will be generated by that tool. So uh, the click wrench, um, again, um, can be a, a very accurate tool if it's used properly. But if we come back out, uh, actually, let's go in here and we can change uh, what our serial number is um, here. Uh, see. All right, and now we can come back out and we can test uh, these tools. We can go ahead and reset um, our indications here. And so as I pull on the wrench, you can see that it is, we're getting where the click is. But if I were to pull a little bit hard on this, you can see where the wrench clicks and then any additional over torque that might have been generated by the use of this tool, depending on how the operator uh, pulls on it. But again, it tells us uh, very clear if that tool um, is performing uh, within the specifications. Uh, but again, the, the click wrench um, is a operator, very operator dependent um, type of tool. Now we can also test uh, the power tool uh, for that. Uh, we would simply um, change out the uh, adapter here um, that we would be using for our quarter inch square drive um, and we can pop in a joint simulator. Um, again, this allows the tool to get to its um, operating RPM uh, and then it will shut off giving us that ability to uh, see the tool perform uh, properly. So we can come back into setup uh, we can go ahead and hit our target torque um, for 8.3 inch pounds. Uh, we can change our mode back to peak because we want to measure, again, the highest peak torque. We don't want to just measure where we see the first peak uh, for that. And then we can also come in and we can change the tool serial number. So if we wanted to remove it completely, we can do that. Or we can come back in and enter in that value. And then we can go ahead and run the power tool. Just a second here. So let me just move, oops, sorry. Hit the camera by accident. So you can see that we're generating um, values that are outside of the what would be acceptable for uh, this particular tool. So in this case, we can go ahead and we can either um, set this tool to be looked at or we can uh, go ahead and make adjustments to that tool uh, and then retest it and then put that back on uh, or back into service. And because the analyzer itself is a calibrated device. Um, the uh, sensor um, is calibrated to a, uh, the dead weights. Um, and so this particular tool uh, would have traceability uh, because uh, this particular tool is being tested on this analyzer, which is linked to the dead weight testing for the sensor here. Um, so we would go keep going back into the final uh, cent or the cert uh, for the weights that would con that would certify the sensor, uh, and then the sensor certifies the an or the screwdriver. So um, that is um, how we can use uh, basically the torque verification process to be able to capture. Um, a tool that may be outside of the specifications. So we're not surprised by anything we might see with a cert that comes back out of the manufacturer's um, working range. So uh, with that, that will uh, wrap up today's presentation. Um, 
we can go ahead and move on to uh, any type of questions that we might have. So let's go ahead and do that. And so, Chris, do we have any questions? Morning, Dave. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, first question that we have is, with the torque test data, does the unit record and store the data as well? Uh, so it, it will, um, in the example that we're used here uh, on our EZ Torque 3, that one will uh, send and write data to the SD card that is within the unit. Um, we do have uh, systems like our PTT and LTT that will hold those readings um, in its memory, and then you can go and download those at a, uh, a later time. Um, but the Easy Torque 3 will capture the readings on the SD card. All right, Dave. Uh, next question was regarding the setting for the frequency, is there a correct frequency to recommend with using different tools? So uh, there are um, in some cases where you're going to want to change the filter frequency. Um, and that is typically only if you are going to be testing um, hydraulic pulse tools. Um, with hand tools and um, shutoff tools, uh, pneumatic or electric, um, or even DC tools, um, 500 hertz is going to be uh, where uh, where you'd want to be, uh, but you may need to move that filter setting again for hydraulic pulse tools, uh, just because of the way that the, the pulse tool functions. So we may see a filter setting of around 1500, uh, maybe even 2000 um, to kind of uh, bring off some of the, the peaks that may be generated by that uh, about how that tool functions. So um, it is very similar um, to a um, uh, an impact type of operation. Um, it's not an impact tool, but it has that same type of hammering um, type of mechanism, um, but it is controlled within a hydraulic uh, clutch. Um, and so those, those readings um, can go from a really high reading to a really low reading uh, in a, a real quick uh, amount of time. And so, um, being able to filter that um, certainly can help uh, bring in the readings for that hydraulic pulse tool. So hand tools and electric tools, uh, 500 hertz is going to be fine. Uh, but if you are going to be testing pulse tools, then you may need to adjust the filter settings. All right, Dave, thanks. Uh, next question is, is a rundown adapter always necessary when you're testing like a power tool and an analyzer or sensor? Um, so uh, it is um, uh, when we're testing a power tool, uh, especially a clutch type of tool, um, you will want to use a, a rundown adapter or a joint simulator. Now, um, ironically, you could uh, use a hydraulic pulse tool <laughs> without the rundown adapter, which would be fine. Um, you can go straight into the analyzer for that um, or to the sensor, but um, typically you'll always want to use a rundown adapter uh, for a power tool. Uh, again, this allows the tool to get to its running RPM uh, and then uh, shut off. Uh, it's gonna give you a much more accurate and uh, representative of how that tool functions um, other than just sticking it straight into the uh, sensor. All right, Dave, thanks. Uh, next question is, should a tool that's being like verified in-house, does it need to be uh, sent out to be calibrated by an accredited vendor or is, is in-house verification sufficient for traceability? So for traceability, um, in-house would be sufficient. Um, again, uh, the, the, the analyzer um, has traceability back to the set of dead weights that were used to calibrate it. Um, and so your tool would then have traceability to your analyzer. Um, so every time that you would necessarily uh, uh, validate the tool's uh, performance on that analyzer, it is traceable um, through the NIST standard uh, for that particular tool. So it, it does not have to be sent out for calibration to still remain traceable. Okay. Uh, next question we had was, for a tool being tested, is there a means to use like a barcode, in a, like a barcode scanner to identify a tool serial number when it comes into like a testing environment? So uh, with our, um, our LTT 
or our PTT unit, we can um, hook up a barcode reader to that um, system and you can create basically a specific test for a specific tool. You can scan that uh, tool. It will pull up that test for that uh, specific item. Uh, you go ahead and take your readings uh, and then it saves all of that information uh, with a time date stamp um, for you. So that is possible, uh, not with the Easy Torque 3, but with, excuse me, uh, either our PTT or LTT units. All right, Dave, thanks. Uh, next question was on the torque verification for torque verification process. Is there like a recommended time interval or frequency to do it, like weekly, daily? Uh, so it, it basically comes down to um, how critical that particular tool performing is going to be within your process. Um, we do have companies that are going to be testing their tools uh, once a month. Uh, we have them that test once a week. Uh, we have customers that will test their tools um, every day at the beginning of the shift, or they test them at the end of the shift. Uh, and in extreme cases, we do have uh, some customers that actually will uh, test their tools before uh, the, that tool is actually used. So they take five readings uh, of that tool. Uh, if that is good, uh, they go ahead and then use that tool. Uh, and then after they've used it, they come back and they take five more readings uh, to verify that. Um, and if there's any discrepancy in any of those before or after, uh, then they they go ahead and either uh, redo the process or um, redo the, uh, the tool. So um, it is uh, up to you and your process uh, on the frequency. Uh, but in, I would say a, a guideline would be um, uh, depending on the level of concern for that particular area, um, you want to maybe do it weekly, um, but again, could be biweekly, uh, whatever you think is best for your process. All right. And then next question we have is what type of, I guess, data is available to export to like a third party for SBC? So um, you're going to get um, basically uh, the reading that was taken. So you'll have the time, the date, the um, uh, if we are testing a specific tool with, with the serial number, you'll have that information. Um, and then you can either have, uh, depending on which analyzer we're using, um, you'll have the min, uh, the max, the standard deviation, you'll have the CM, CMK values um, for that particular uh, reading, uh, if you're doing a group within uh, on a specific uh, tool. So those are the types of data information that you would get. Um, but importantly, you'd have the time, the date, um, the tool and the reading. Um, and then from there, you can uh, track that however you, you think best. All right, Dave, that was lots of our questions. All right. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I appreciate uh, you joining us uh, today. Uh, if you have any questions about um, a torque verification process, feel free to reach out um, to us and we will certainly try to get you uh, hooked up with the right information for your process. So until next time, thanks very much and have a great day.